Uh, so this is kind of a review. In fact, these questions that we're going to cover today are really from the exam bank uh, from which the midterm is drawn. Now, you're, not pro you're probably not going to get the same questions, or you might get one or two of the same questions. You're not going to get most of the same questions, but these are fairly comparable to the ones that you're actually going to see on the exam. Uh, number two, of course, what I want to do is I want to kind of get us back into the swing of things. You know, we've got some more interesting stuff coming up over the next few weeks for this course. And, of course, what I want you to do to kind of get back and get back the feeling of it and get get back into the calculations and the concepts and all that and what better way to do that is there than to do some practice questions so let's take a look at some of these practice questions some of them are relatively easy some of them are relatively hard but we will go through all of them first question on august 19th 2004 and i have them over here on the left hand side of the screen i have them here in a pdf Google IPO offered over 19 million shares at $85 per share, which were sold at an online auction in a bid to make the shares more widely available. Is this a primary market transaction or a secondary market transaction? Anybody have any idea what number one is? Are we talking about primary market or secondary market? Um, well, this is what, of course, is called a primary market transaction. The primary market is the difference between a primary market transaction and a secondary market transaction is that a primary market is when the company sells its own shares, when the company sells its own securities. When it is resold from an original purchaser to a subsequent purchaser, for example, on a securities market like the New York Stock Exchange or whatever it is, that is called a secondary market transaction. But because Google is selling their own shares, it would be considered a primary market transaction. Okay, let's look at the second one over here. Listen, this is something that we covered way back in class one. A corporation earns eight thirty per share before taxes. So we'll say eight thirty per share. And the company pays a dividend of four dollars per share. Okay. The corporate tax rate is thirty nine percent and the personal tax rate is fifteen percent and the personal tax rate on non-dividend income is 36%. Now, there's a lot of numbers here. You don't necessarily need all of them to get the answer over here. Uh, what, is, what is the after-tax return an individual would receive from the dividend? Now, of course, a corporation pays income tax on the money it earns. But after the taxes that a corporation earns, it decides how much of that money to then distribute to the person. So how much is the person getting per share? Well, the person is getting $4 per share. Now, of these taxes in here, the 39% corporate tax rate, the 15% dividend tax rate, and the non-dividend income tax rate is 36%, which one is the person paying? Which one is the individual paying over here? Uh, which one would you say? Is the person paying the 39%, the 15%, or the 36%? Anybody have any idea? What is this a tax on? <clears throat> okay, so this is a tax on dividends. So because this is a tax on dividends, he was pay he's paying the 15% dividend tax rate, right? So the dividend tax rate is 15% of $4. Now, of course, 15% of $4 is 60 cents, right? 0.15 times 4, which would be 60 cents, which means that how much is he getting altogether? What's the after-tax amount the person would receive from the dividend? Well, of course, it would be the $4 minus the $0.60, cents, and overall it would be $3.40. Now, again, it tells you about the corporate tax rate, but he's not paying the corporate tax rate because the dividend in general is applied only after the dividend tax is, the corporate tax is paid. Okay, uh, a printing st company prints a brochure for a client and then bills them for the service. At the time of the printing company's financial disclosure statement are prepared, the client has not yet paid the bill. How will this be recorded on a cash flow statement? Okay, well again, this is something that we covered in class two when we were talking about uh, cash flow and statements and balance sheets and things like that. Anybody happen to remember way back from class two what this would be called or if you have any kind of other accounting background? Um, anybody remember what this would be called? Something that you uh, do not, you have not received yet, but you are scheduled to receive it? Okay, this is what is called a Okay, let's see, this is what is called an 
account receivable. Anybody remember that that term? This is an account receivable. It's it's reported as accounts receivable, which is money that you do not have yet, but money that you are going to receive. So on a cash flow statement, it would be considered an asset. It's not a cash app asset because you don't actually have it, but yes, but it would be accounts receivable is what you'd be looking for over here. Okay, very good. Now we get into some of the ones that are a little bit more math-based. GenCorp has a total debt of $140 million and stockholders' equity of $50 million. It has 26 million shares outstanding with a market price of $4 per share. What is its market debt-to-equity ratio? Well, debt, as you may recall, includes its debt, but it also includes stockholder equity. Yeah, exactly, like a schedule of payment, sure, it is something like that, yes. Um, now, again, this is something also we covered back in class two. Obviously, all these things that we covered at one in one class or another. But you may recall that on a balance sheet, you had assets on one side and you had debts on the other side. And of those debts, you had obviously whatever debt you owed, but also shareholder equity. Now, in this case, we're told that the debts are $140 million and the shareholder equity is $50 million for a total of $190 million, right? Now, what are we talking about in terms of assets? There's 26 million shares outstanding with a market price. Uh, what's its equity? Its equity is, well, we're told it has 26 million shares, and each one is worth $4 a share. So, which means its total equity is simply 26 times 4, which is $104 million. So, its debt to equity ratio would be its debt, which is $190 million, to its equity, which is $104 million. And $190 divided by $104, I'll just whip out my little calculator over here. We're asked its debt equity ratio. So, its debt is. 190 to 104, which gives it about 1.83, approximately 1.83, something to that effect. Okay. Uh, by the way, can everybody hear me? Okay. I, somebody, somebody reported that I'm that I sound a little. Uh, there's a little bit of a problem with that, my audio. How's the audio doing? Okay. Okay, fine. Okay, no problems. Okay, thank you. Okay, so again, it just might be a, a little bit of a hiccup in the in the person speakers. Okay, very good. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question: A wholesale food retailer is offered fifteen dollars and sixty cents for is offered fifteen dollars and sixty cents for five thousand cartons of peaches. The wholesaler can buy peaches from its growers at thirteen twenty per carton. Shipping costs two forty for the first thousand and one ninety per carton. Will taking this opportunity increase the value of the retailer? This is a classic question of whether a transaction is worth it, and you simply have to measure the costs versus the benefits. Right? It's a classic cost-benefit analysis. So, what are the benefits? Well, he's offered fifteen sixty for 5,000 cartons. Okay, let's multiply 1560 times 5,000. Now, 1560 times 5,000 is 78,000, according to my calculation. Yeah, it sounds right. Okay, $78,000. So his possible benefit, what he's going to sell it for, is 78,000. Okay, let's measure the cost and see which one is more. You can buy peaches. So first of all, you have to buy them. How do you buy them for? You buy them for thirteen twenty, and of course you have to buy whatever you're going to sell. So you have to buy the five thousand. What's thirteen twenty times five thousand? Six six is that right? Uh, five times two is ten. Ten times thirteen twenty. No, I'm sorry. No, <sighs> never mind. <laughs> I should be able to do it in my head, but for some reason I'm 
locking it, so I'll say 13.2 times 5,000. So, yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. What am I talking about? That is, that is right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I second-guessed myself over there, but I did. Anyway, so 66,000. What about the shipping? The shipping is, well, 240 for the first 1,000. Now, 240 for the first 1,000, of course, is 2,400. And then a dollar ninety for the next four thousand for all the for the remaining four thousand. Okay, this should be easy because four times nineteen is seventy six. Yes, yeah, so that's seventy six hundred. Okay, very good. So seventy six hundred. So then we can simply add this, and if you add them, then you get uh, well seven twenty four and twenty seventy six is exactly ten thousand. So that becomes seventy six thousand altogether, even. Which means the costs are 76,000 and the benefits are 78,000, which means the opportunity will be will result in overall a profit of $2,000. Again, there was nothing fancy or complicated here. You were just taking two sides. If you're offered a transaction and the transaction tells you specifically what uh, you know what it's worth and what you can sell it for, well, okay, what are the costs? What are the benefits? Here the benefits are $2,000 more. So if you can execute this plan, you're going to make a profit of $2,000. Okay. Yes, exactly. So it's definitely better to um, well, I guess if you, if you have the opportunity to buy it directly from the grower, certainly, but it, the thing is, it's, it's a good deal for the retailer, even though you're going to have to pay shipping. Okay, let's now, for the next several ones, I think we're going to have to look at questions that are, there we go, that are questions that are going to be based on present value, future value, things like that. And these are all things that we covered during the first uh, part of the course, but let us go ahead and do them. And we'll, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to chime in. I'm going to try to do these relatively slowly. We do have some time. Uh, we'll get through as many of these as we can. <coughs> Let's try the one on top over here. An annuity is set up that will pay $15,000 for 10 years. What is the present value of the annuity given that the discount rate is 9%? Okay. Now, by the way, I'm not going to use the financial calculator. You can, you can use the financial calculator, but I'm just going to use Excel for all of them. Uh, I generally use Excel when I'm doing these kinds of things in real life, so might as well use it for the, for the course as well. But again, you can do most of these things in the financial calculator as well if you like. All right. Um, first of all, our, remember our five basic terms were present value, future value, the rate, the number of periods, and the payment. In this case, we are looking for the present value, right? So we'll call it PV. Now, in Excel, you could simply use that as the present value formula, but we're going to need to put in the other four inputs. N for the number of periods. Uh, let's see. Um, future value for the amount that it's worth at the end interest rate, and of course the payment. Okay, so let us use the future value. Um, I put the present value on the bottom just because that's what we're looking for over here. And as I could have put it in, in, a, in a different one of these spots, I haven't put the formula in, but I just put it on the bottom over here just because that's the one we're looking for in this question. And you know, in other questions we might be looking for other things. Okay, so first of all, let me pipe in the formula even before we start that and before we even fill in the numbers. Now, in Excel, the present value is simply PV. So I'm going to say equals PV, and I'll open up, oops, I'll open up the parentheses. The rate, which is this one over here, notice, I don't know if you can see it, that tiny little uh, thing on the bottom, it tells you what to put in each box. So the first thing is the rate, then the number of periods, which is this, the N, that's the number of periods, payments, future value, and for type, we'll do zero because that's the standard type. That just means that the payment is the end of each period, which is the normal thing. Now, so far, it's zero, obviously, because so far, there haven't been any periods. Here, we are doing an annuity. The annuity will pay $1,500 per year for 10 years. So which box does that 1500 go into? That goes into the payment box, right? Because that's being paid out every year. It's not being paid out in one lump sum at the end. If it were lump, one lump sum at the end, it would be the future value. So we'll say 1500 <coughs> for the payments. The future value, what's an annuity worth at the end of the annuity? Once the annuity is over, how much do you have left? You got nothing, right? <laughs> it's done. So we'll say zero. Okay. What is our number of years? 
10, good. And what is our rate? Don't worry about what what you have the number on the bottom over there. It'll it'll be uh, it it doesn't mean anything until you filled in everything. Uh, nine percent, right? So in Excel, we'll just put in 0 0.09, or you can just or you can actually write out nine percent. Either way is fine. And what we come up with is nine thousand six hundred and twenty six dollars and forty nine cents. And that's your answer. Simple enough, right? You could have done it in a financial calculator that way. If you did algebra, you'd probably be there for, if you did it the algebraic way, you'd probably be there for a half an hour trying to figure it out. <laughs> Thankfully, we've got a much easier way to figure it out, and that's just by pumping it into Excel. Okay, let us take a look at another problem. Matthew wants to take out a loan to buy a car. He calculates he can make payments of $5,000 per year. You can get a four-year loan with an interest rate of 7.9%. What is the maximum price you can pay for the car? Very similar question to what we just had, uh, what we just have, but maybe slightly more complicated. First of all, of our five basic functions, which one are we looking for here? Um, well, remember, he says he can make payments of, of $5,000 per year. So we know what the payments are. But, you know, this is really kind of the same kind of question because we're really just looking for the present value again, right? Remember, because what, what's the question? What's, what's the question of what he's doing now? The question is, what is he paying now? And so that's a, that's a present value question. Whenever you're talking about how much money you're getting as a loan right now or how much money you're paying right now uh, for annuity or something like that, you're talking about the present value. So let's clear our data points over here so that we can start over. Uh, what is our N? He can make repayments of 5000 per year. This is a little confusing because normally when you make car payments, you're making them per month. But here you're making them per year. Again, it's not usually the way it happens. But in this case, you're making it, uh, you certainly can make payments per year. So here we're just looking at four years of paying $5,000 per year. So for the number, we'll simply put in four. Future value, by the way, in a loan is always going to be zero because once the loan is paid off, the loan is paid off. So the future value is going to be zero. What's our rate? Our rate, of course, is 7.9%. Good. And by the way, last time I put 0 0.079, or I just want to show you you can do the other way. You can do 7.9%. I'll just uh, type in 7.9%, which is the same thing as 0 0.079. And at what's our payment? Our payment is $5,000 per year, right? So we'll put in $5,000. And that means our present value is $16,597.56. That is the amount that Matthew uh, can pay for his car. If he can pay up to $5,000 per year, 7.9%, the maximum car he can buy is $16,597.56. Okay, that is that. Is that. Okay. A business promises to pay the investor 6000 today for the repayment of 1500 in one year's time, 3000 in two years' time, 3000 in three years' time. What is the present value of this business opportunity if the interest rate is 6% per year? Now, <laughs> this is a little more complicated because of the fact that you have different amounts of the payments. If the payment were 2000 per year or 3000 per year, I would just pump in the same exact formula, and that would be easy. But because of the fact that you have three diff you have at least two of them are different from each other, there are really two ways to do this. Number one, you can do use the net present value formula in Excel, or you can separate out as three different cash flows. Uh, here, by the way, again, by the way, this once again is a present value question because we're looking to see is the total value of these three cash flows, the $1,500 cash flow after one year, the $3,000 cash flow after two years, and the $3,000 cash flow after three years, is that worth more or less total than the $6,000 today? So there are two ways to do this. I want to do it the more complicated way first and the less complicated way second. <laughs> Let me first put in, the more complicated way is to do, is to do it as three different cash flows. We'll do it as cash flow one, in other words, cash flow for year one, and then we'll do it as cash flow for year two, and then cash flow for year three. 
Now, year one, and let's, of course, to avoid confusion, clear all this stuff over here. For year one, we're getting a, at the end of one year, we're getting $1,500. So I'm going to put $1,500 as our future value. Now, for the, these are these are individual cash flows, so we'll just make the payments all zero. Because again, you're not you're looking at each one as an independent cash flow at the end. So at the end of year one, you're getting fifteen hundred dollars cash. At the end of year two, you're getting three thousand dollars cash. At the end of year three, you're getting three thousand dollars cash. But let's take a look at the number of periods in each one. Now, of course, in, for, for the first year's cash flow, it's one year. For the second year's cash flow, it's, yes, this is all recorded. For the second year cash flow, it's two. And for the third year's cash flow, it is three. In other words, each one, each individual cash flow, each individual, the present value of each of these payments is based on how many years it's going for. Now, the rate, we're told, is 6% per year. So that's, that applies to all of them. So I'm going to say 0 0.06 for the first one, and I'll say 6% for the second and the third as well. And now we can figure out the values. Well, we've already figured out the values of each of these. The $1,500 after one year is worth $1,415 today. The $3,000 after two years is worth $2,669 today. The tw the $3,000 after three years is worth $25.18 today. Again, because the longer you have to wait, the less it's going to be worth. Basically, they're decreasing by 6% a year because that's the normal interest rate. So now let's simply add them up. And I'm going to use the sum formula to add all these up. And what we have is a total present value of 660394 So if we are asked to... Um, to pay the investor 6000 today for a payment of each of these, the present value of all the payments is 660394 which means the present value of the business opportunity is $603.94. In other words, if you're paying 6000 and in exchange you're getting something that's worth 660394 then, of course, the present value of the business opportunity is 603.94. Okay. Um, now, the easy way, by the way, there, or the shorter way, is the net present value rule. The net present value is a way to kind of figure these out uh, just by virtue of your payments. All you have to do is put in the rate and put in each payment for after the first year, after the second year, after the third year, and it will figure out. In fact, let me let me um, let me do it separately. If the on the net present value formula, which is in Excel is NPV. Let's say payment one, payment two, whoops, I'll just say payment one, payment two, and payment three, and I'll put our rate up here. So our rate was 0 0.06, our first payment was 1500, our second payment was 3000, our third payment was 3000 and using these I'm sorry this is 3 not 4 the net you can just use the net present value formula so you'd say equals npv open up your parentheses put in the rate first and then first value second value using a comma in between the third value and then just close the parentheses and excel will you the answer, which in this case is 660394, which is obviously the same thing we got. The reason why I did it the other way first is because I wanted to kind of show you how it works in that it really is establishing the values of three different cash flows separately and then adding them together. But fortunately, Excel has that NPV formula, that net present value formula, which is, some, which is what you use when the payments are not all equal. You just use the interest rate and each of the payments individually. Okay? Again, if anybody has any questions on that, if you'd like me to do another example, I'll be happy to do another example. Uh, let me, let's do another example. Why not? Let's do another example of net present value. Um, let's say I say, okay, I'm going to give you, uh, let's say, 
two hundred and seventy five dollars the first year the first uh, year uh, three hundred and sixty seven dollars the second year four hundred and seventy dollars the third year and seven hundred and eighty nine dollars the fourth year let's just say for argument's sake and I want to say okay how much is the present value of each of these cash flows this is after year one this is after year two this is after year three after year four and let's say I tell you that the prevailing interest rates are 4.5 percent so I'll say 0 0.045 so if I want to figure out the net present value of these cash flows, all I would have to do is say equals NPV, open the parentheses, start with the rate, which is this, and then I could simply add in all of these as the values, and the answer would be $1,672.72. Just add them all up as the, as the various payments. It's the exact same thing as what we did over here. Okay. So that is that problem. Let us take a look at the next problem. Here we start to get a little bit further into what we covered. This is probably already up to class four or five, <coughs> maybe even six. The table shows interest rates available from investing in risk-free U.S. Treasuries. And the investment offers a risk-free cash flow of, of $100,000 in two years' time. What is the present value of the cash flow? Again, we're looking at a present value. Nothing any more complicated than what we already did. Let's do the four basic things. We've got a future value. We have the number of payments. We have the, um, uh, the rates. And we have the payment. And we're trying to figure out the present value. We're specifically asked, what is the present value of that cash flow? So let's say we're talking about two years. For, uh, let's let's put in the formula before we even put in the uh, put in the numbers. So I'll say equals PV for present value. Rate is the rate. Number of periods is the n. I'm using commas in between each one. PMT we'll put over here. Future value is whatever's over here. Type is zero. Okay. Let's type in them once one. Let's type one at a time. Here we're asked two years. What what is the n in that case? Anybody? What's the end? Two. Good. Two years. Perfect. What's the future value of this bond? Well, it tells us that we are offered a risk-free cash flow of how much in two years' time? We're offered a risk-free cash flow of $100,000, right? So the future value is $100,000. Remember, if it was an annuity like it was being paid every year, it would be a payment. Here is just one end of year or end of period cash flow. What's our rate for our two year bond? 2.25, very good. So I'll put uh, 0.0225 or 2.25 percent, either way. The payment, of course, is zero because there's no uh, coupon on these bonds. So the answer is 9564744. Now the question didn't ask us, but just for kicks, let's do let's put all of them in. Let's let's do let's do everything on this chart. And all I'm going to do by the way is I'm just going to copy this same formula three more times and we'll change up the numbers. And of course so far we have the same because everything's the same, but let's change it up a little bit. Let's do the 5, 10 and the 30. The, by the way, the future value is the same for all of them. They're all $100,000 bonds. The payments are the same for all of them at zero. The only two things that are changing are the rates and the, and the number. So the numbers, I think, five, 2, 5, 10, and 30, whereas the rates, the five-year is 3.125%, so I'll do 3.125%. The second one is 3.5%, so I'll do 3.5%. And the third one is 4.375%. 4.375%. It rounds it off, but we'll extend it. Anyway, these are the prices. For a two-year bond that, that has a $100,000 maturity, at 2.5%, we'd have to pay 95647 If it were a five-year bond with this interest rate, you'd want a zero-coupon $100,000 bond, you'd have to pay 85739 
For a 10-year bond, you'd have to pay 70000 For a 30-year bond, you'd only have to pay $27,000. That's the good news. The good news is you're paying only 27000 and getting a $100,000 bond. The bad news is you're not doing, you're doing without your money for 30 years. <laughs> you know, that's why people who are willing to buy really, really, really long-term bonds can make a lot of money, but on the other hand, they can't touch their money for 20, for 30 years. So that would just, just based on these interest rates, everything the same so far, um, we just look at the different prices of these bonds. Again, the only, the one, it was, yeah, if you, and it's pretty good interest rate, 4.35% is a pretty good interest rate. Not, you know, unbelievably great, but, you know, not too bad. Certainly in today's day and age, that's a pretty good interest rate. Maybe, maybe you think you can make more if you invest in stocks or mutual funds, but if you can find a bond like that and you want to invest uh, $27,000, 27,677,613, $6, you can get a $100,000 bond after 30 years. All right, let's take a look at the next page. Consider the following investment alternatives. This, it tells you APR and how often it compounds, and which offers the lowest effective rate of return. Now, this question is a question about the difference between EAR and APR. Remember, APR is simply the annual interest rate divided by however many times it compounds. Like if you get 12% APR, that means 1% a month. The other type of interest rate, which we briefly discussed in class five, was the EAR, the effective annual rate, or sometimes also referred to in popular culture as the APY, the annual percentage yield. And what they ask you is what is the effective annual, what is the lowest, um, or you know, they could ask you anything. They happen to ask which is the lowest effective rate of return. So that is the effective annual rate. Now, fortunately, Excel has a formula for that, and that is effect. The effect EAR is the, the effective annual rate. And in Excel, it's effect. You just put an equals effect, open the parentheses. Then, then you have the only thing they need is the nominal rate, which is the APR use this one, we, won't, we didn't fill it in yet, and then the number of periods, which we'll use as this box. So, so far, it's not, there's nothing there. But so you only have to put in the APR and the number of periods of compound, compoundings. The number of compoundings. Oh, okay. So let's take a look at each of the three investments. Well, first of all, let me... Got a couple of lines in here. We have four different alternatives. We've got the annual, we've got the daily, we've got the quarterly, and we've got the monthly. And for each of these, we're going to figure out the effective annual rate, and we're just going to apply the same formulas. So far, there's nothing there because the numbers haven't been filled in yet. But either of them, all of them notice is just effect, parentheses, this and that. Okay. What is the APR of each one? Okay, let's take the first one. The first one's APR is 6.903%. So I'm going to put 6.903%. Now, what is the number of compound? Oh, first of all, let me expand this. Yeah, okay. What is the number of compoundings? An annual compounding is going to compound how often? I know it sounds like a, you know, fairly obvious, and it is fairly obvious. Something that only compounds annually compounds how often in, we, in a year? One, exactly. And of course, by the way, the notice the EAR is the exact same thing as the APR because the only the, the whole difference between the EAR and the APR is that the EAR compounds. Uh, <laughs> throughout the year. Now, if it only compounds once, there's no difference between the APR and the EAR. Okay, so let's look at daily now. Daily is what percentage? It's the APR being 6.6922%. Okay. How many times does this compound? If it compounds daily, how many times does it compound in a year? In other words, the interest builds on itself. How often this time? Well, how many days are there in a year? <laughs> assume it's not a leap year. Assume it's a regular year. 2019. 365, right? So the EAR is based on that, an eight, with an APR of 6.69, 
if you compounded it every day, you know, there's every day the interest from yesterday built up a little bit, then it would overall be an effective yield of 6.92. Now all we got to do is just apply the same numbers and measure them against each other. Okay, what's the quarterly interest rate? It says 6.7787%. How many times, if it compounds quarterly, how many quarters are there in a year? Four, and then that makes the EAR, again, all we do is just apply the same formula. That makes the EAR 6.95. Notice they're all pretty close to each other, but so far quarterly wins it, and the worst so far is the annual. Uh, and what about monthly? Well, monthly we are told by the chart that we have 6.7643. And how many times does it compound? 12. And so therefore, the effective rate is 6.97. So it looks like our best rate looks to be the monthly, and our worst rate looks to be the annual. <coughs> Notice, interestingly enough, the annual had the highest APR, but it has the lowest EAR. APR doesn't take compounding into effect. APR just is based on the total yearly interest rate, and that's all you get. The EAR takes more often compounding into effect, and so even though the annual had the highest APR, it has the lowest EAR, and the best one seems to be the monthly, which is over here. Okay. Number, well, our next one. We don't have numbers, but the next one. A $1,000 bond with a coupon rate of 6.2% paid semi-annually has eight years to maturity, and a yield to maturity of 8%. 0.3%. Okay. Um, what will happen? And the yield to, if the interest rate rises and the yield to maturity increases to 8.6%. In other words, our interest rate is 8.6%. What happens to the price of the bond? Obviously, the original price was $1,000, but now we're looking for the new price based on these numbers. What kind of a problem is this? Are we going to be looking for present value? Are we going to be looking for future value? Or are we going to be looking for rate? What are we looking for? Well, I'll tell you a little trick. Whenever you are looking for price, what does that mean you're looking for? Present, oh, present value, right. Future value is what you're getting at the end. Future value is the face value, the, the amount of, usually the amount of the bond. Um, if, it's a, if, if it's a zero coupon bond, or really even if it's a coupon bond, the, the future value is the, is the face amount of the bond. Okay, good. Uh, so what we're looking for is the present value. So let's go back up to this one. You know what, rather than, I'm just going to copy the same, rather than do the whole thing over again, I'm just going to copy and paste the whole thing. <laughs> uh, I know, a little lazy over here, but that's okay. And basically this is just going to keep the, keep the present value formula. I can retype the present value formula, but I've, hopefully I've done it enough times that you, you get the point by now. Uh, the present value formula is simply the present value, and then you put in the number, and you put in the rate, and you put in the payment, put in the future value, as they ask for. So now we've got to figure out each of these things. What is the number of payments as a coupon rate of 6.2%? 6.2% .2 of 1,000 is $62. Right? So $62 are paid a year. But this isn't paid per year. This is paid semi-annually. That means twice per year. So how much is paid out for each coupon? When each coupon is paid out, when each interest rate is paid out, how much is paid out? Remember, coupon rate means what percentage of the face value is paid out each year. Now, 6.2% 6 of 1,000 is $62. If it's paid semi-annually, so how much is paid out with each coupon? Close, just to the other, other direction. Remember, semi-annually means it's paid out the total of $62 per year. 
I, I see what you were thinking. You were thinking that it's paid, uh, right? It's it, and you were thinking it's paid sixty-two dollars twice a year. Is so how much it's paid in a year? Right, exactly. It's thirty-one. In other words, I, I know that, that seems a little confusing, but six point two percent. It's not obvious from the question, <coughs> but the general way coupon rates work is the coupon rates is how much is paid in a full year. So if sixty-two dollars are paid in a full year, so semi-annually thirty-one dollars would be paid. But that's that's a good point. In other words, if it would be sixty-two dollars paid out per t per payment, then it would be 124 for a year, but the 6.2 coupon rate means $62 for the whole year, which means $31 per coupon. Okay, what is our number? What is our number? That's no, you're 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 thinking on the right track, no question. You just I just didn't tell you <laughs> that that, uh, that 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 62 6.2 percent means for the entire year. Uh, so, but you're definitely thinking on the right track. Um, okay, what about the number? How many periods are there here? Okay, are there eight years? But we can't think of it as being eight periods altogether because the payments are made semi-annually. That's what makes this question a little bit harder because you've got to break it down a little bit more. In other words, there are eight years, but how many periods are there altogether? How many payments are made altogether? 16. Very good. Okay. What's the future value? How much is this bond? I mean, ignore, ignore the red number so far. We'll worry about the red number after we've plugged in all four values. It'll change as we move along, but that's okay. Uh, so, well, the future value is not zero because this is a bond. This is still, we still got, a th after, the, after the eight years are up, we've still got a $1,000 bond. Remember, a coupon bond retains its face value, which means after the, after the eight years, you get to walk into the bank and cash it in for 1000 bucks. That's the way that's the way coupon bonds work, and that's the way zero coupon bonds work. Also, the face amount of the bond is the amount that you can walk in after the term is up and cash it in. So at the end of this eight years, this bond is still worth a thousand dollars. We got a thousand dollar future future value. What is the rate? What's the interest rate that we're looking at here? Rate is synonymous with yield to maturity when you're talking about bonds. The yield, you'll, with bonds, instead of, instead of using the word rate, for some reason people always use the word yield. I'm not 100% sure why, but you hear that also on the radio or whatever it is. Yield, zero yields, or yields are up, yields are down, whatever. But anyway, a close, you're, you're on the right track. Definitely 8.6 is the right answer, except what's the one more thing that we have to do to the 8.6 to account for the slight variation with this problem? Again, yield to maturity is something yet close. <laughs> Again, on the right track. That's the 8.6%. Exactly, we've got to half it. And the reason is because the 8.6%, again, is per year. Interest rates are always expressed in a per year basis. So each period, remember, there are 16 periods here. Each period is a half a year, right? So in a half a year, think about it, everything here is in a half a year. 16 periods are 16 half years. This payment is per half year. So the interest rate is half of the 8.6, which of course is 4.3%, which makes our price at $863.22. Notice, of course, by the way, that the price went down. Originally, the bond was worth $1,000. Now, the yield to maturity went up to 8.6. The price of the bond went down. As we discussed in class five, when the price, when interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down. Because this bond, think about it, this bond is only paying out 6.2% interest, whereas interest rates have risen to 8.6. If I had money to invest, I could make 8.6% instead of the 6.2% that this bond is paying me. Therefore, if I'm going to buy this bond, I'm going to have to buy it at a discount or I'm not going to buy it at all. And that discount manifests itself as $863.22. Right, so, um, right, the number of year, the number of periods doubles. I mean, you could think of it that way. I, I wouldn't think of it so mechanically. I would just think, in terms of the number, just think about, okay, how many periods are there? How many payments are being made? Well, if there's eight years and there's two periods a year, so there's 16 payments. I mean, yeah, you can memorize it that way, but I think it's, you know, maybe a little bit easier if we, um, you know, kind of focus on, like, why, why that is. You know, let's say the interest rates went down. Instead of instead of the interest rates being uh, if 8.6%, let's say the interest rates went down to 3.6%.
which means the semi-annual rate will be 1.8%, then the price of the bond will go way up. The lower the interest rate, the higher the price of the bond. You can see what happens to that. Okay, let us take a look at the next one. Here we got another bond question. We've got three more questions altogether. All right, uh, let's see. The above table shows price of $100 face value, um, you risk, several risk-free zero coupon bonds. What is the yield to maturity of the two-year bond? You know, they only ask us for one of them, but let's figure them all out. Why not? Let's do the, matu the all five maturities. One, two, three, four, and five. And we could use the same formula for all of them. Now let me bring this back a little bit here to make it a little easier to see. Okay. Present, these are all present value. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Asking, oh, this is a little different. This, ask, this is asking for the yield to maturity. So let's, let's change this a little bit. In fact, let me put, what's the, which, one, which of these five things is the yield to maturity? Which one are we looking for? We're looking for the rate, right? Rate, well, yield and rate are always synonymous when you're talking about bonds. So I'm going to delete this formula. I'm going to let's put the rate down here. In fact, let's put the present value up here. Whoops. I'll put the future value here. It makes no difference. And let's use the rate formula. Okay. So <coughs> for rate, I'll just do equals rate, like in Excel. And so the number of periods, which is the N, the number of p the payment, which is down here, the present value, which is here, the future value, which is here, and the type is zero. I don't, you know, I don't know. I still don't know what that guess guess function means, but whatever, who cares? Okay, and I'm just going to pump it into each one of these five lines, and we're going to do five different bonds. Now, the good news is the payments we know these are zero coupon bonds. If they're zero coupon bonds, what are the payments? For all of them. They're zero. Exactly. They're all zero. What is the future value for these bonds? They're all the same. That's your hint. They're all 100. Very good. They're all $100. Uh, one second. $100. Okay, there we go. Okay, perfect. Okay, fine. Rate hasn't applied so far, no problem. Okay, hundred dollars each. What is the present value? Well, that that you have to look at the chart. The present value is the price, right? So the first one was ninety-seven point twenty-five. The second one was 94.53. The third one was 91.83. See, these go very quickly if you just plug them into Excel. The fourth one was 89.23, and the fifth one was 87.53. These were the prices. And what is the number? Number of periods? Well, that's the same thing as the maturity year. The first one is one, the second one is two, the third one is three, the fourth one is five. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to copy and paste this line here, and it will give us all the relevant interest rates. And why is it not giving us the relevant interest rates? Oh, I know why. Because one of them has to be negative. That's, that's, that's an important thing. I, I mentioned this way back when, but uh, you can't do both the present value and the future value positive. One of them has to be negative because you're paying into the system one of them has to be going into the system. So I'll make this negative and this negative. I'll just, I'll make all of these negative. And see, it's, it's listing them all as three, but that's just because it's rounding off. Well, if you use this function over here, this expands it a little bit. You can see they're, sli they're all slightly different from each other. Um, I think the rest should be good. Okay, good. Okay, so the rate, and again, that's that's an important thing. I just want to mention it again because uh, if you, this thing over here in Excel allows you to increase or decrease the decimal when you're talking about a percentage. The default might be to round them all up to 3%. You don't want that because you're looking for the difference between them. So you got to expand the numbers uh, to at least be able to tell the difference. So what's the yield to maturity of the two-year bond? 
is the question, and that is 2.85%. If they wanted a one year, it's 2.83, three years, 2.88, four years, 2.89, and the five year is 2.70. Again, just these numbers plug into this rate. All uh, the question, the, again, if you're using Excel, these, these all can, can be done you know, very quickly. All right, the last two are based on, um, are based on the perpetuities formula. Now for this, instead of using Excel, I am going to uh, pop up my whiteboard over here. Okay. Now, in case you didn't remember, the value of a perpetuity is the same idea as the value of a stock. A perpetuity equals the amount of the payment divided by the rate. Now, <clears throat> the perpetuity means how much is something going on forever. So, for example, if uh, what's the value of a perpetuity of $100,000 and I get 5% interest rate? Well, that would be uh, $100,000. I'm sorry, the payment. Let's say, what's the value of getting $2,000 every year forever? So I would do $2,000 divided by the interest rate of, let's say, 5%, and $2,000 divided by 0 0.05 is $400,000. So that would be the value of a perpetuity. The value of getting $2,000 every year forever, assuming an interest rate of 0.05%, would be, would be uh, $400,000. The value of a growing annuity, which of course a stock usually is, the value of a growing annuity is the value, or the price, equals the payment, divided by the interest rate minus whatever the growth is. Again, this is something that we covered in class 7, but just to reiterate it, and it's going to be relevant for the last two questions over here, the price of a perpetuity, and a stock is a type of perpetuity because a stock theoretically goes on forever. Of course, you know, the company could go bankrupt, and uh, but you, you don't know that one way or the other. So you just have to assume that it's going on, you know, it's going on for the foreseeable future. It could go up, could go down. So the price of a stock based on this, uh, this dividend model is the amount of the payment. Now, of course, when you're talking about a stock, the payment is the same thing as the dividend, because the dividend is how you get your money out of a stock. So it's the, pay, it's the dividend divided by the rate, which is also sometimes, when you're talking about a stock, by the way, the rate is the sometimes known as the COC. Anybody remember what the COC stands for? The COC stands for the cost of capital. How much money do you have to pay to keep operating the business? What kind of an interest rate do you have to pay to keep operating the business? So when you are looking at the dividend model in terms of to figure out what a share price is, you simply do the dividend divided by the cost of capital minus whatever the growth rate is. Okay, so let's take a look at the second to last question over here. Valence Electron has 213 million shares outstanding. It expects... Um, it expects earnings at the end of the year of 800 million. It pays 40% of its earnings in total. 15% is dividends and 25% to repurchase shares. If the dividends, if the earnings are expected to grow by 7% per year, they don't change, and the equity cost of capital is 9%. What is the share price? So for the share price, we're going to have to figure out these three things. We're going to have to figure out the payment or the dividend. We're going to have to figure out the cost of capital, and we're going to have to figure out the growth. Once we have that, we can apply this formula very easily. Now, the bottom two are easy. The cost of capital, we are told, is 9%. The growth, we're told, is 7%, right? It says specifically they're expected to grow by 7% per year, and the cost of capital is 9%. That's easy. The dividend is a little harder. The dividend is, first of all, how much does it earn per share? We aren't told how much it earns per share. The only thing we're told is that it earns 800 million, and we're told that the total number of shares is 213 million. If we were told how much it earned per share, then that would be our answer. But we don't know. We're just, we're just told that it earns 800 million total, and it's got 213 million shares outstanding. Which means that in order to figure out what our earnings per share are, we have to divide 800 by 213. And 800 divided by 213, let me just whip out my little calculator over here, 
800 divided by 213. I've got, I'll round it up to 3.76. So that means $3.76 earnings per share. Remember, we need to figure out the amount of dividends as, as, that, is, that are being given out per share, so we have to figure, it, figure that out to start with. Okay. Of that 376, how much is going out as dividends? Does the question tell us? Yeah, the question told, tells us that 15% are being paid out as dividends. Now, another 25% are being used to repurchase shares, but that doesn't matter to us. We, we, the only thing we need to know is what are the dividends. Remember, that's part of the formula. So we need to multiply this by 15% to figure out how much is our dividends are being given out per share. Okay, 3.76 times 15%. I'll just multiply it by, oh, what I, I still have the 3.76 on my calculator. I'll just multiply it by 0.75, and what I come up with is about 56 cents, a little bit more than 56 cents, but you can round it off to 56 cents. So my dividend per share is 56 cents, which means my price is the dividend, which is 0.56, divided by the cost of capital, which is 9%, or 0 0.09, minus the growth, which is 0 0.07. That's the same thing as 0.56 divided by 0 0.02. And if we, if we divide that, 0.56, well, yeah, it's 0.56 times 50, which, of course, has to be exactly $28. So the price based on this question is $28. Okay, a little bit of a complicated one, but as long as you put all the steps in, pretty straightforward. All right, let's take a look at the next question. Similar question. Jumbo Transport, an air cargo company, expects to have earnings per share. See, here we're given the earnings per share, so it's a little easier. <coughs> Before we have to divide the earnings by the outstanding shares, here we are given the earnings per share of $2, right? It decides to retain 10% of these earnings in order to lease aircrafts, le lease aircraft, excuse me. Uh, so it retains 10%, which means how much is it given out? Well, if it's retaining 10%, that means it's given out 90%, right? So the dividend, so you, you, if you can multiply it by... 90%, which gives you $1.80, and $1.80, this would be the dividend, right? Again, this is common sense. If it's retaining 10%, then that means it's giving out 90%. It's giving out 90%, and the earnings per share was $2. That means the dividend is $1.80. And it tells us the return, of, the return on its investment. Now, return on investment, or ROE, is, of course, the same thing as growth, is 25% of the 10%. 25%, it says, return on investment, 25% of the 10% that it's retaining. Right? <clears throat> Let's read that sentence carefully. It decides to retain 10% of the earnings to lease new aircraft, and the return on the investment will be 25% of the 10% retained, which means 25% 20, of 10% is 2.5%, right? 25, yeah, to one quarter of 10% is 2.5%. So the growth is 2.5%. Is what is the cost of capital? What is the rate? Well, it's, it tells us the cost of capital is 11%. So let's apply the formula. The price is the dividend divided by the rate minus the growth. Well, the dividend is $1.80. The cost of capital is 11%, 11 and the growth is 2.5%, which is the same as 0 0.025, which gives you... 1.8 divided by uh, 0 0.085, and if we do that on our calculator, 1.8 divided by 
zero eight five. What I have is approximately Uh, 21.18, approximately 21.18, give or take. Okay, um, so that is the top of the hour, and that also happens to be um, the end of the sheet that I have over here. Now, if we talk